Yeah, I was thinking the other day, I got my own little window over here. It's not exactly secret. In fact, really all it does is just make recording in this space impossible during the day. But that has nothing to do with secret window, secret garden. But I had no idea how to open this. He had been flying passengers long enough to know a good bit about group psychology. When a passenger freaked out, few, if any, of the others had ever moved. Most air travelers meekly surrendered the option to take an individual action when they entered the bird, sat down, and buckled their seatbelts around them. Once those few simple things were accomplished, all problem-solving tasks became the crew's responsibility. They pay us hundreds of thousands of dollars or more a year, and they really do it just for one reason. They know that in almost every pilot's career, there are 30 or 40 seconds when you might actually make a difference. They pay us not to freeze when those seconds finally come. I found though that in real life, coincidence is not the exception, but the rule. As a human being who had gone through his life to that point of making decisions on instinct rather than reasons, he was surprised and intrigued to find that he was actually on the horns of a dilemma. You never ever asked Lady Luck for a date. She had a way of standing men up just when they needed her the most. But if she showed up on her own, it was wise to drop whatever it was you were doing and take her out and wine her and dine her just as lavishly as you could. That was one bitch you always put out if you treated her right. The hand clamped over his was very strong. It hurt and he began to cry. The sun was still out, the grass is still green, but suddenly the whole world seemed distant. No more than a cruel mirage in which he was for a little while allowed to believe. Every now and then I start to think I'm over it, and then it gets on my blind side and it hits me again. I guess some things take a long time to shake out. In fact, some things don't ever shake out. He didn't believe that people knew when some things were over. He believed they often went on believing, or trying to believe, even when the handwriting was not only on the wall, but written letters large enough to read a hundred yards away without a spyglass. If it was something you really cared about and felt that you needed, it was easy to cheat, easy to confuse your life with TV and convince yourself that what felt so wrong would eventually come right. He supposed that without its great capacity for self-deception, the human race would be even crazier than it already was. Hey, what's up, bookworms and constant readers? Mike back today to talk a little more King, Stephen King, as we dip into the second part of Four Past Midnight, the 1990 novella collection. Uh, again, guys, this one is a little different than different seasons, but this one is mostly just horror stories. And Secret Garden, Secret Window, or Secret Window, Secret Garden, rather. I get it backwards every single time. But <laughs> it probably won't be the last time on this video either. This one, I, I would say it's, it's probably the least horrific of the four because well reasons and we're going to kind of get into those but as always guys this will be a non-spoiler review if you haven't read it you're still perfectly safe by now i feel like most people have seen the movie but we're going to talk about the book and i will probably mention a couple of differences from the movie here just because there are some things that uh, are very very different and i want to not kind of gloss over those but i read this for the first time when I was 15, same story you guys have heard. We're getting close to that time, by the way. We get to, I think, Neville things. was like the last thing I read on release day. But we're getting very, very close, so I don't have to open with the story every time. But I read this when I was 15, and I didn't understand a lot of the uh, the themes and, and, and different kind of things in the book because I hadn't experienced very much yet. Guys, I was 15 years old. There's not much you have experienced at that age, right? So was it different this time we are going to talk about it? Let's begin like we usually do, guys, but getting into what is it about. Now, Mort... Rainey is a successful author who's having a bit of a rough patch in his personal life. While working through an ugly divorce after his wife has fallen in love with another man, 
He retreats to their lake cabin where he does his best writing to clear his head and work on his next novel. One day he is awoken by a knock on his door by a man named John Shooter, who accuses Mort of plagiarizing his story, Secret Window, Secret Garden, and simply changing the name to Sewing Season. The man threatens Mort and gives him three days to prove that he wrote the story first or face humiliation and maybe much, much worse. And that takes us into 1990, guys, and Secret Window, Secret Garden. I got it right that time. Okay, guys, usual format here. What makes this book good or bad? I like to begin with the good, and I got to say the biggest thing that I took away from this that I didn't really get when I was 15, because, guys, I, I had never been divorced. I went through some really nasty heartbreak and things like that on the path to getting to being happily married. But there are some things there that I was able to relate to a lot more this time because if you've been in a serious, serious relationship and it just suddenly ends and it's not by choice, it's the other person's choice, it's almost like dealing with like a death. It really is just like a, such a jarring change in your life. And I think with this book going through the bitter ugliness of a nasty divorce and it really is just up in front in your face the whole time about how much this can completely derail your life in your current especially if you've been married for a long time or you've been with that person for a long time and then it ends so suddenly I mean, a lot of divorces yes people grow apart and it's, it's somewhat a mutual thing or one wants out and the other one's just like you know i mean that that sucks i thought we were gonna work this out but all right when it's just one person has fallen in love with someone else and you still very much love your spouse that's 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 got to be the most horrible thing i think that a human can under just just go through it's got to be absolutely just devastating you know to kind of come to terms with that but like i said at 15 i didn't really understand a lot about love and loss you know i think at that that age i was just happy that uh girls would respond to me when i said hi you know so i hadn't really gone through a lot of these things but now like i said went through some really uh nasty nasty breakups and some really just some real heartbreak along the way like I said, and I, I think I was able to relate to that much, much more. Uh, but, uh, you know, the troubles with moving on, you know, the troubles with moving on, especially when you're still in each other's lives, you know, more still really talks to his wife. So it's, it's, it's hard to ever really move on when you're still communicating with each other. And the fact that you know, he, there's so many things that they still are just so used to relying on each other about, you know, but uh, even then you see when they do talk within a couple of minutes, it, it, it just turns ugly. So you see that it's never gonna be quite the same for them, but it's just, just showing that, that how difficult it is to kind of move on with your life. That's a huge one here that I think he really, really nails. You would not expect the guy that wrote this uh, has been married to his spouse for, you know, decades. But uh, yeah, it really is just um, uh, um, the mental pain and anguish of, uh, you know, your wife loving someone else and moving on and you still have it. I just, he really captures that sense of pain extremely, extremely well and how hard it is to get your life back on track and get back into your normal processes after a really, really nasty divorce. You think about just something as simple as, you know, going to work, especially when you're a writer, because I mean, this is a King book, so of course the protagonist is an author, right? Uh, but uh, it, it's just thinking you're never going to be able to get your head clear enough for that. You're, especially you're going through depression. All you want to do is eat, sleep, and, and if you can eat. Some people eat when they're depressed. Some people can't eat when they're depressed. Uh, you know, it just kind of depends on the person or what kind of heartbreak it is. I don't know. I'm not a depression specialist. But uh, yeah, I do know that uh, as someone who has suffered from depression, chronic depression for uh, for many, many years, uh, I won't get into that one here, but uh, I can I can say he really captures that well and seeing that it's impossible. I would not think that you would, you would instantly have writer's block if something this, this traumatic happened in your personal life. There's no way you're going to be able to write, much less when someone comes knocking on your door like John Shooter does. But uh, I think it's an examination of how much stress the human mind can take. This is something that King does very well, obviously. Uh, how far, almost like in that uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe or Lovecraft way, and how much can the human mind take before it starts to break down? You start to question what is real and what is not. Uh, really, he really does a great job of making the reader wonder, you know, um, how much of this is unreliable narrator? How much of this is actually happening? How much of this is not? How much of this is paranoia? You know, because there is a lot of things where, you know, you don't know who's doing what why they're doing it. Uh, you think you know, but do you know? Mm, you have to read and find out. But uh, it, it's uh, questions of how far 
someone will go to deny the truth about themselves as well. Because, you know, the whole time it's uh, more just like, you know, uh, ex-wife's a bitch, it's all her fault. And you start thinking, well, you know, was any of this your fault? Did you push her away? He does start to question some of these things. You know, he walks into like a business and he's wondering, you know, because everybody knows a small town, everybody knows him. And he's one, everybody just thinks he's, uh, you know, just awful. Is everybody just assumed that's him? It's just part of the thing where it's like, is this really happening? Or are you just kind of putting this on yourself? You know, uh, it's not always about you, but it's also not, uh, not about you. You know, I, I don't know a better way to really put that there, but, uh, yeah. Uh, how many horror elements like murder and cruelty to animals and terrorizing someone's life can really go by without you, you know, having some kind of just either a nervous breakdown, uh, a mental break, or just completely just, you know, just losing your marbles. It really does a good job of that. And it has, like I said, all those, those, those uh, horror elements like that, especially the cruelty to animal stuff. It is, it is violent, and it is descriptive, and it is in your face, and it is very, very difficult to read in the best way that King does like to do these things. Now, like in the uh, dark half here, he does bring up the uh, obsessive fandom uh, and and, uh, I guess like the endless accusations of plagiarism. You know, this is something that he talked about with the dark half. That's obviously something that the the protagonist in that book dealt with. And I'm sure Mr. King has dealt with several times. You're that big of a reader, biggest horror writer in the world at the point. And especially when this book comes out, he was still at the top of everyone's list. No matter what he put out, people were going to be buying. I still think he still is, but I'm just saying, this was when he was still riding that wave. Tommy Knockers, in hindsight, is kind of knocking him out, but he still was very much a author that would he would no matter what he could have wrote like his uh, his uh, his drink order on his napkin, and people would have been reading it. So I, I think with this, it, it really does show how much he probably did get a lot of this kind of stuff. He did get people saying, oh, you stole my story before because they're just wanting to use him to try to make a name for themselves and stuff like that. It's going to happen, but dealing with the obsessive fandom and things like that, it's got to be very, very difficult. And I, I do like that King continues to write those kind of things into his stories. It's what makes him so personable. But uh, it has one incredible twist in this book that if it hasn't been ruined for you, it actually makes the reread an incredible experience because there's things I didn't notice, obviously, the first time that I feel like, oh my God, it's like blatantly obvious now, but you don't notice them your first read unless you're really, really, really looking for them. Uh, But uh, again, I hope that that twist hasn't been ruined for you because it really does make you question everything this whole book up until like the last 30 pages you really will be like i don't know i think that well we got this this and this for evidence but you have this as counter evidence over here and you're like that doesn't make sense but when it happens it does make sense and it's like oh my lord wow i the whole time yeah so uh I, I think it's a really great book to uh, to to reread if you've already if you've already read it once because you can see things you couldn't see before but you don't hear me sitting here, guys. Look at all these books behind me. I'm never going to be able to read everything. I ain't got time for too many rereads these days. But uh, like I said, I read these all when I was younger, and I liked the experience of reading them again and seeing how I feel about them in my 40s as I did to when I was a teenager. But there are some bad things, guys, here. Uh, I think you can figure out the twist pretty easily if you're super trying. I have always been an along for the ride type reader. I'm like, tell me your story. I'm going to sit back and I'm just going to go where you take me. I've never been the type that tries to think ahead and say, ah, I saw that coming. I mean, if I see it coming, I, I usually think that you're telegraphing things pretty bad because I'm not looking for those things. I don't like to, I don't like to think I'm a dummy about it. I just like to think I'm not really looking for these things. So uh, if I have the, the kind of reader where I read a chapter and I stopped and I thought about it for an hour, maybe I might be like that. But, uh, you know, with a King book, it's just we got we to get through this because I can't stop reading it. And this was no, no different. But uh, a lot of people have said they have figured out that ending before it actually happened, that twist. Uh, so you might. Uh, the animal cruelty might be tough to read. Like I said, uh, I think these are things that King does well. This is why we read Stephen King is because he will make us uncomfortable. That's what makes his book so good, to me at least. But uh, yeah, if you're uh, you're real, real sensitive about something like that, might be a struggle to 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 get through some of those parts. And the ending can be kind of anticlimactic. And this is where I'm going to talk about the movie. I think that the movie's ending was better than the book's ending, and that rarely, really happens for me. I mean, I know people love. I mean, they made a hobby out of shitting on Stephen King endings. Uh, I don't think this one's bad. I just think that the movie did it better. It was much, much more satisfying. Cr- cruelly satisfying? Does that make sense? 
then this one where it just kind of seems like, huh, well, there, that's it, huh? That's, uh, okay, not quite what I was expecting. Whereas the movie just had you just kind of like sitting there staring at the screen like, really? Wow, yeah. So uh, it, that and The Mist, I think, are two of his books where the endings have been changed that I think is just for the better. So there are some really good uh, movies out there. As far as that movie adaptation, I thought it was fine. I know a lot of people say, oh, I didn't think Johnny Depp was good as Mortimer. I thought both those lead actors played their parts really, really well. And it really did uh, capture the sense of, uh, of, of depression and uh, the, how nasty a really bitter divorce can be. Very, very well. Now, guys, again, why you should read it. I think not since Pet Cemetery has King captured grief and loss so well. Now, obviously, with that, it's dealing with much different type of loss. But like I said, a, a lot of people will say you've been married for 20 years. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you're still very much in love with your spouse. And out of nowhere, they're like, I'm in love with someone else. I'm leaving. Peace. Bye. That has to be like, you have to be like feel like a widow. You have to feel like your spouse just died. That could be the only way that you could probably process something like that. And I think that he captures that every bit as well as he does the loss of a child in Pet Cemetery. So a very, very, very good reason, I think, to read this just to see how well he's able to capture stuff like that. Now, if that's something that's going to make you depressed, I don't know if I would recommend that you read it. But obviously, uh, you're reading King. You're not reading it for the uh, puppy dogs and rainbows, right? You're reading it because you want to be down here in the muck with the rest of us. But Obviously, like I said, uh, different types of loss, but uh, divorce, he does he does treat it like death here. And if you want a fast-paced uh, story with, with some horror elements in it, I think this one will definitely scratch that itch a little bit. There are, There's no supernatural here, so I know that a lot of people don't like King books where there isn't supernatural. I've always said what makes his book great is where he uh, says that, you know, the actual real monsters are humans and what they do to each other. And that's no different here. But if you like to question and decipher what is real and what is not the whole way, you're going to dig it quite a bit. Now, in my final thoughts, I'd have to say, I think it's aged pretty well. Uh, with uh, with Langoliers, I was still kind of like, okay, you know, some of the technology and stuff like that. Obviously, when you're dealing with things like that, yeah, you can be some things you can be like, oh, it's charming, but you know, it does kind of date. But this one, I felt like this could be something if you unplugged from the internet, if you didn't have a smartphone, you just went out to this cabin, uh, your lake house to to write a book, I could see, hey, this is aged great. You know, they don't have a lot of uh, communication, stuff like that, if you want to unplug. And I could see a writer doing that. I could see a writer completely unplugging to try to get their life back on track and get back into their craft. I could see that quite a bit. So I think it kind of helped it feel like it is aged pretty well. Uh, I think I appreciate this a lot more at 42 than I did at 15, like I said, just because I've been through some of those real life experiences now. Uh, I don't think I've ever... Uh, really been to the point of like a nervous or a mental breakdown yet, you know, but uh, uh, who knows, you know, um, <laughs> who knows what can happen in the future. But I, I do think that, uh, yeah, hopefully I don't ever have to deal with a uh, divorce or a spouse passing or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things that I, I, I think that I can understand a lot of those themes now that I've actually experienced uh, some, some, some painful breakups along the way. But like I said, I, I'm happily married now. I can't imagine starting my life over at this point you know uh we've been married uh, almost 11 years we've been together for 15 i just i can't imagine completely starting over like mort's trying to do in this book it's got to be just absolutely devastating and again he captures it perfectly here but uh it affects everything in your life from your sleep to your eating to your living habits to your work productivity and again I think that is just captured absolutely brilliantly. So uh, yeah, this is going to be one I'm going to give another recommend to. This is uh, this one is two for two so far, and we've still got two stories left to go. Coming up next, we're going to have The Library Policeman, one that people aren't very familiar with because it's one of the few King books that has not had an adaptation yet, but it should, and we're going to talk about why on uh, the next episode of Into the Multiverse. Before I go, there are a couple of of multiverse connections, but not really, guys, there's one. I really sit here and thought about it for a while. I could not think of anything. And this one's really, really weak. I just don't know what else to put here because I mean, when I started Into the Multiverse, it was like, I'm gonna talk about the connections and all these books. I could find one, one. And it's not really just exclusive to it. It's that Mort and Amy lived in Derry before the divorce. And Derry's been in a few other books besides it. But obviously it is the big one there. But guys, that's that's really it. I, I think that's, that's the first two books where I was stunned at how little connections there are to the multiverse. 
So maybe King was just trying to, you know, hey, I want to do like one-offs. I said these books very much feel like Twilight Zone episodes. So maybe he was just trying to kind of do that Tales from the Crypt, Twilight Zone kind of thing, where it's just like kind of a standalone kind of deal. Maybe that's why he's not tying too many connections into these books. But guys, that was Secret Window, Secret Garden. What did you think? Have you read it? Drop in the comments and let me know, and I will talk to you there.